when a team of volunteers working in Cambodia is kidnapped by Khmer Rouge guerrillas. They're in the hands of some of the most fanatical killers in the world. We are a neutral organization. Cut off from rescue, driven deep into hostile territory. Where are you taking him? Each mile could be their last. Stop shooting! But one man has a plan to keep them alive, and his only weapon is his mind. Cambodia then was a country in turmoil. It was on its knees, 20 years of civil war. We were going down the same road that we'd always been going up and down when we reached a clearing. And I saw some movement in the bushes, and I just felt something was wrong. And then suddenly, out of the tree line, charged 30 well-camouflaged soldiers. Your mind absolutely races. Thinking, God, are they just going to shoot us here? It's so utterly confusing. I know nothing about what is going on. There is a Khmer Rouge soldier with a machine gun. And I begin to think, oh, God, are they going to crossfire us? We wait for what seems like an eternity. And all the time I'm thinking, please, God, do not let our life end here. I'm made to drive for what seems an eternity. I keep trying to establish a relationship and talk to them, but they won't talk to us. I'm anxious. No one looks at me. The women won't look in my eye. They all look away. They look down. They, no one will make eye contact. The children don't laugh. Deep down inside, I begin to think maybe there is no hope. And that's when I have to banish the demons. I stop thinking about just what the worst case scenario might be. If I start to think about my fear, it's opening the floodgates. So all of the time, it is about controlling the way that you think. In these situations, are forced to confront a side of yourself that perhaps you might not have been introduced to. It doesn't seem likely that they're going to keep us for a long time. That's just not the way they think. We are either to be executed or released. To Chris's astonishment, they are ordered to start driving out of Khmer Rouge territory. But there's a catch. They've only got 24 hours. We start driving, and we're free. We're going back. And then to my complete horror. It's their old enemy, the commander who first captured them. He's not exactly overjoyed to see they're still alive. In exchange for the keys to the Land Rover, the commander agrees to let them ride out of the forest on the Khmer Rouge truck. Front. The fact that what I hated in Khmer Rouge might also be in me too. A very wicked thought. Maybe I should kill the boy soldier. I've even got my hand on his neck. In the end, of course, reason wins through. At the edge of the forest, the boy soldiers return to their village, leaving Chris and his team to make the final stretch of the journey to freedom alone. We walk almost the whole night, from 7 o'clock at night until 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm very, very tired. I, sometimes I could not walk properly. But Chris, he's still strong.
I think it's the most moving um, moment of my life. This is a place where the children are laughing and the children are playing. They're just so pleased that a bad thing hasn't happened. <laughs> and at this point, I get a very big lump in my throat, and um, I must confess, I shed a tear, which I rapidly wiped away in a sensible and British fashion. Ready. See, the problem with landmines is that once the fighting stops, these things are, are killing and maiming people for decades afterwards. For some strange reason, I felt something was wrong. I turned. And then... ringing in my ears, burnt, about to die. I was fading in and out of consciousness. All sorts of weird experiences, looking down on your body. I look down, I see this blood in it, and I start seriously praying, please God, please God, don't let me die. I can remember thinking, I am gonna be very, very lucky to live. People talk a lot about the survival mechanism and that your survival mechanism kicks in. Well, that wasn't the way it was. When the pain starts to hit you, I think it reaches a stage where it is so bad that you actually want to die. You would rather give up and pretend it wasn't happening and just turn over and just fade out. Dying is definitely, in those circumstances, the attractive option. It's easier to die. I thought of all the reasons I had to live. <coughs> to see my family again, uh, to see my friends, to see my niece grow up. Once I'd made that decision to live, I knew then that I would survive. most of the time is that we stop here at this point at which it's uncomfortable at which it all hurts a bit too much but the reality is that we have the capacity to go beyond that point if we believe we can if you fall over keep on getting up